I'm gonna talk about marriage today, okay? Now, if you're not married, take notes. Because my goal here is that your marriage doesn't stink. So how do you even know if you're gonna do something, you should prepare to do it, prepare to do it, right? That in your life, God is always preparing you for what he has you to do in the future. So every season of your life is a preparation for what is to come. So if you're sitting around doing nothing, waiting on Mr. or Mrs. Wright to come, just swinging by your house, you know, while you're sitting there doing nothing, how about prepare? while you're not married. So I know sometimes if you're not married that, that sermons like this can, can kind of like, um, like, well, talking to the married people, here I am still single. That's not the point. The point is, is that when you're not single anymore, I want you to be happy like you are now. Amen? So, so preparation is the key for whatever you're getting ready to get into. And, uh, and I would highly suggest you take notes. I would highly suggest if you're a man, take notes and let your wife see you taking notes. It will indicate the, to you that maybe for once in her life, she's seeing you take it seriously. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about being uncaged. Sometimes in our marriages, it's more like a cage match than just being in a cage, isn't it? Um, but I believe that God has called us to experience each other in in amazing ways that we haven't experienced each other yet. Just because you're married doesn't mean that the exploration stops. It doesn't mean you've climbed the mountain. It just means that now you're doing life together and there's a whole new, a whole new horizon out there to chase after. And so today I wanna talk about that. Ephesians chapter five just as soon as you got comfortable. I'm going to ask you to stand back up. I had somebody tell me the other day, uh, talking about the addition and, um, you know, that they were in a church that had really nice, thick padded seats. And they said, "Uh, man, we should really consider that when we go out to the new building. And I said, man, that's awesome. I said, the reason our seats are poorly padded is because we need you to leave after the service so that another service can come in. So I'll keep you standing for a little while longer so you don't think about the bad seats. Ephesians chapter five, I'm gonna read this in two different translations if that's okay with you, not the same time. But, uh, but I'm gonna read it from the NIV and then the message paraphrase. This is, what, this is hands down my favorite portion of scripture on marriage. And I'm gonna explain something to you that you probably don't know about this because this portion of scripture is called more angst uh, with people in modern history than any other marriage scripture because we instantly read the first thing and it says, wives submit to your husbands. And then it's like, there you go again. If you knew my husband and I do and I know it's difficult. So I wanna make sure you understand the context that was written in and you're gonna, you're gonna have great joy when I explain that to you. So Ephesians chapter five, starting in verse 21, the NIV translation, here we go. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, I love the way Eugene Peterson puts this because it paints this marvelous picture. He uses some 
great terminology. So let's read it again in the message. Out of respect for Christ, be courteous and reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church. Not not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ, as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Now, doesn't that sound pleasant? All right, the next section. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best in her. Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. And that's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery and I don't pretend to understand it all. But what is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Father, we thank you for this word to us today. We pray that when we leave here, that the chase would be on. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. All right, just sit down. Don't say anything to anybody because it's already tense. I don't want to start any arguments before we even get started. You don't even know what to say. Like he's going to say submit. I know he is. One of the things that is important about reading scripture is also digging into it enough to know who it was written to. Because I could write a letter to my wife and have you read it in the context that I wrote it to you and you would feel really awkward. (laughs) So it's important to know the context of what it was written in, the culture that it was written in, everything. And so what happens is when you study the, the environment, the culture that was Paul was writing this letter into, that Greco-Roman culture, all the obligations in marriage were on the wife. There were no obligations for the man. Some of you ladies are like, yeah, I know what that's like. (laughs) All the obligations were on the wife. There were no obligations for the man in marriage. And so when you read this portion of scripture Paul is writing to the Ephesians church, he is now throwing that culture on its head. He did say at the beginning, wives, submit to the authority of your husband. If you read the paraphrase, he's actually saying, honor and cherish your husband, do all these things because your husband is treating you like Christ treated the church. It's not hard to submit to a guy who's willing to die for you. Amen? Amen? I mean, I mean, it's not hard to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because while we were sinners, he died for us. He chased us the whole time. So it's not really hard to submit to that authority. But what you find is Paul writes just a little bit to the wife and then he drops the hammer on the man. He says, love your wives as Christ loves the He says, love them as you love your own body. He spoke right to the narcissistic, prideful behavior of all males. Because all males at 19 years old stand in front of the mirror like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No wonder she wants to be with me, right? So he's saying, as you love yourself, men, love your wife. So this is brand new. To this culture, Paul is, Paul is just transforming the way they think. He's saying, listen, in the body of Christ, it works totally different than what you're used to. This is not a male domineering situation anymore. This is you guys working harmoniously together for the cause of Christ. There's the, there's the relationship from the church to Christ and there's a relationship from Christ to the church. And, and the relationship, by the way, from Christ to the church is much more than vice versa. So he's saying, men, listen up. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
And I love the way he puts it, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant in holiness. He's, he's saying, everything you do as a man should be to bring out the beauty in your wife. Didn't he just say that? Let, let, me, let me make sure. I could, have been, I could have been making it up. He says, Christ loves to make the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her. It's designed to bring the best out of her. So when you first got married, you're choking down that dinner. You look up and you say, you are amazing. <laughs> Just think about it. Six weeks ago, we were eating hot dogs and now spaghetti. <laughs> this is going to be so fun. I'm not an expert in marriage, but I've been in one a while. I started thinking about the relationship between the church and Christ and Christ and the church. And what I found was, is that, that there's a constant pursuit between the two parties, chasing each other. Wasn't it fun when you were chasing each other when you were, when you were first dating? Wasn't that the funnest thing? My wife and I still remember things about that, like the big 20. Do you remember that? I remember when 20 ounce sodas came out. Anybody remember that? It was shocking. You'd go into sheets and you'd buy a 20 ounce soda. Before then, it was only 16 ounce bottles. I told you I'm older than I look. <laughs> remember, there was no internet and cell phones and 16 ounce bottles. That's all there was, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, so rough back then. It's almost like the depression in the, in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> what? So we went into sheets one night. And we said something about the big 20. It's like the first time I'd ever bought a 20 ounce soda. And we never forgot it. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> but we just never forgot it. I won't tell you about all the other stuff. But the idea that was, was that we were chasing each other. Like I would want to get off work early and, and want to be at her house all the time. And, and I think she wanted to do the same with me. And, and, but it was a pursuit. And I started looking, you know, Paul's saying, listen, a marriage relationship should look a lot like the relationship between Christ and the church, where, where Christ is providing this, this unconditional love and, and support, and everything he does is to bring out the best in the church, and the church willfully takes his leadership because it's so unbelievable, his love for them. And so we submit ourselves as a church to Christ's love because it's a glamorous, extravagant love that we've never experienced before. So why wouldn't we submit ourselves to it? Because he, he's taking, we just saying, he could take us places we've never been before. And so Paul is saying, listen, men, listen up. Men, men, listen up. I say this every time I counsel people in marriage, which I, I try to do it early and often, and then I, so I don't have to do it often later. <laughs> I believe the man has the majority of the responsibility heaped on him by God in the relationship. Amen. Thank you. First service didn't get it at all. The ladies were just like, what? <laughs> I believe this, that God set it up so that the man was responsible so the man was responsible for the spiritual leadership of his home, the, le the leadership of his family, his wife, that, that he was responsible for the condition of his wife. Oh, wait a second. Did you hear? Everything Christ does is to evoke the church's beauty. If you want your wife prettier, then do something about it. And I'm not talking about Botox. I'm talking about chase her a little bit. Pursue her a little bit. You want her to smile? Make sure she understands that you love her. Not just going, hey, baby, the TV's on. I love you and everything, but good grief. I mean, it's a ball game. I thought we settled this already. But, but Paul says, men, listen up. Your responsibility in this deal is huge. And that was earth shaking to the people he was writing it to. Your responsibility is massive. In this relationship, 
And Christ loved the church, so you should love her the same way as Christ loved the church. And so what I I started seeing in that relationship back and forth is this constant pursuit of each other. Didn't God pursue us? Doesn't God pursue us? Won't God pursue us? So it's past, present, and future. He's constantly pursuing us. We are his prize. We're his bride. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the thing that it all culminates in. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Like it all ends with all of his church sitting down with him having dinner. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And so he's been pursuing us, he is pursuing us, and he will always pursue us. We're, we're the prize, we're the apple of his eye, we're, we're the reason he died. And so then it also, all through scripture, shows us a picture of us then in, in response to God pursuing us, us pursuing God. So this pursuit is nonstop. Here's some scripture to back it up, to think if I'm making it up. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 starting, I'll read this in the message paraphrase as well. Christ arrived right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, thank God I didn't have to get ready before God came to get me. Amen. Amen. He didn't wait for us to get ready. When he presented himself for this sacrificial death, when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready, And even if we hadn't been so weak, we couldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worthy of dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice, but God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. That's a beautiful way to put that, isn't it? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Philippians 1 6 being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion he will pursue you to the end of it I love the end of Jude the doxology of Jude to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy he will pursue you he's the one that can keep you he will never leave you or forsake you all the way to the end Luke 19, 10, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to chase you. Now, now God chased us. Now, now, now that doesn't stop once he finds us. He's still pursuing us. He's still, he's still, he's still bringing out the best in us. He's, he's still working in and through us. All things work together for those to good for those, right? He's still working good out in your life nonstop. And so our, our, our response to that is a natural pursuit of him. Man, this God that died for me, this God that put it all on the line for me, I want to know him more. So Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come on, it's this constant tasting. It's not one time. Uh, We we went to dinner the other Friday night uh, with some friends and and it was a, uh, I heard the word foodie come up. And and what happens is, is once you taste something that's really good, don't you want to taste it again and again? And then you want it to taste better over time, don't you? I'm a huge fan of chocolate ice cream. I mean, is that Okay. Some of you are like disappointed, like, ah, oh, that's why he's out of shape. <laughs> Just think chocolate ice cream is one of the best things ever put on the planet. And so I can tell you the difference between a $3 bucket of chocolate ice cream and a $10 bucket of ice cream, chocolate ice cream in a moment. And my pursuit in life. Shinkatig Island, the Island Creamery, hand-dipped chocolate ice cream. Lord, Calgon, take me there or whatever, you know. <laughs> get me there somehow. I can, you get the wa- hot waffle cone and they, and they, and they just ridiculous amount. They're, they're bringing out the best in me every time as it gets higher and higher. You just eat the whole thing. It's like four pounds of ice cream on one cone. <laughs> and I'm up for any better places if you know them. I'm in pursuit of the best tasting ice cream. 
God says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know that there's, you know, if, the, if Paul describes heaven as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for us, then, then how can the pursuit get tiresome when the ice cream gets better every day? When you can sit down to a bowl of chocolate ice cream and it tastes better on your tongue every time you dip your spoon in it. God's saying, your pursuit of me can be like that. It's this constant improvement. It's this constant. Matthew 6, says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these, all these things, everything else. He says, pursue me first and I'll bless you beyond what you can imagine. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. He said, I've given everything to you. Now, when you turn in response to that with everything you have, you will find me, God. You will find me. And so remember now, Paul is writing this analogy to the Ephesians and, and, and their culture is all the responsibilities on the women, no responsibility on the men. And Paul now says, Christian marriage doesn't look like that. Christian marriage looks like this. The husband leading so well, the husband loving so well, the husband evoking so much beauty out of the wife, the husband laying his life down that the wife in response will submit to that. Not out of domineering, but out of, man, you're the man. Right? So there's this pursuit that's happening constantly between Christ and the church. And so I thought, started thinking, well, if there's a pursuit constantly between Christ, Christ and the church, why isn't there a pursuit constantly between the husband and the wife? Because I remember when there was. Some of you have been married for a while. You remember, I remember when we used to chase each other, right? I remember when we used to call into work. I remember when we used to make excuses to be around each other. I remember, I remember when we used to lie about what time we were going to get home, where we were. Oh, none of you did that. I remember all those times were so fun and we were learning. And so I thought, man, if we're going to uncage a marriage... There needs to be this concept of a, cons a consistent and persistent chase that never, ever, ever in the in this expanse of your marriage should there, should there be a time where you're not chasing each other. And what I found is in, those, mo in those, those seasons when you don't chase each other are when the things start to creep up, aren't they? So watch this. Three things really, really easy. I mean, all this is easy, right? Three things. The pursuit is never circumstantial. The pursuit is never circumstantial. Look at, your, look at your spouse or your neighbor and say, listen, this is never circumstantial. Go ahead and tell them. It's never circumstantial. It's never based on the circumstances. You know what I figured out? And I've said this here before because this is an aspect about marriage that I absolutely think is hilarious. When you were dating, chasing each other, Ravished by love. You would overlook everything. Your friends could come up beside you and say, are you seriously dating him? He is amazing. He's been drunk six out of the last seven days. He's so cute when he's drunk. You can't see anything. Five years into it, you're like, I married a drunk. Like it was, like it was a surprise. <laughs> it's, it baffles me sometimes. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I gotta be so careful in mixed company. Um, <laughs> but all these things that we would overlook. I, I've told you before, I had a friend that told me, man, the way she brushes her teeth, it's gonna get on your nerves. Sooner. I'm like, no way. She's a queen. Then you wake up one day, you're like, Lord, give me strength, give me stamina. I want to make it to 10 years. <laughs> but I started asking myself, why was I so willing to overlook? I was so willing to overlook because I thought there was something to be won. 
I thought there was, I was chasing her. I was chasing. So, so I would overlook all these other things because I hadn't caught her yet. But there, there seems to be this time after you catch what you're chasing that now the same thing that you would overlook would now become an irritant. And I'm going, wow, it really happens that quick. It really happens that quick. So, so what I started looking at is that God chasing us was never based on the circumstance in the moment. It's always based on evoking our beauty in the moment. Oh, come on, church. Him chasing us was never based on whether we were irritating him in the moment. It was never based on whether we were sinning in the moment. It was never based on whether we were doing something habitual in the moment. It was him chasing us to bring out the best in us. And so what happens in our marriages is we chase each other at the beginning. And maybe you stretch it to three or four years and, and it's, so, it's awesome, it's cool, and, 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 and every you're still chasing each other. And then all of a sudden circumstances arise that cause you to run a little slower. That cause you to not chase as much. That cause you to not pursue as much. And then everything beyond that becomes based on the circumstance you're in, not evoking the other person's beauty. And so now our relationship is circumstantial. I love you as long as you love me and do what I ask you to do. I love you as long as, as, long as you're holding up your end of the bargain. I love you like, like I, 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 I'll treat you well as long as you treat me well. And listen, that's not what Paul said. Paul said our relationship to each other is like that of Christ to the church. Can I go out on a limb and say this? Men, we are the example for this. Love your wives as Christ loved, to the, loved the church. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Him chasing us was never circumstantial, and so it should never be that with your wife. She did not become less pretty because she married you. You know what, you know what, you know what, what, you know what one of your biggest fears should be? If my wife married somebody else, would she be better than she is now? Oh, I heard a lot of, mm, mm. Because Paul said in our relationship to our wife, we're the ones that bring that out. We're the one. If she's not pretty enough, it's because I'm not chasing her enough. It has nothing to do with the circumstance we're in right now. Can't there be beauty in pain and suffering? Can't there be beauty in difficulties? Can't there be beauty from ashes? All those things. The only reason it's not being evoked in my marriage is because I'm not chasing it. Because he put, the, he put the responsibility on me to bring the beauty out. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not fluffy and, and frilly and all that stuff. As soon as he talked about dressing in dazzling white silk, I started breaking out cold sweats because I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but here's what I do know. I want at the end of the day that God can say your wife was the best she could possibly be because she was married to you. There's a whole lot of nervous men in the house today. You're being very reserved. Evoke her beauty. Dress wearing dazzling white silk. Everything we do, it's the chase. It's not circumstantial. God has never been circumstantial to us with his love. He's never withheld his love because you didn't quite get it right. He's never, he's never backed away from us because, no, he's in this constant pursuit. And so if circumstances in your marriage have caused you to back off, the, the, the remedy to that is not to make some excuse for why you backed off, but jump back in full force and say, I will pursue beyond the circumstance. Because guess what? Here's what I found after almost 21 years. Circumstances are seasonal. If your kids are driving you crazy right now, I'm laughing. I'm like, that's so awesome. Because I've already done that. <laughs> I remember when our kids were two, four, and six. I remember when they were one, three, and five. Every Tuesday I had off, and I did Mr. Mom at the house with them. My wife locked up all the guns. 
Not because she thought the kids were going to get to him. I was like, I can't do this anymore. (laughs) Come on, man. You know what it's like. Right before your wife comes home from work, you're like, kids, get the house cleaned up. (laughs) Hurry up. Your mom's coming. (laughs) Like we're all guilty, right? (laughs) Don't tell her dad's been laying on the couch all day doing nothing. (laughs) (laughs) But guess what? It was a season of life. So why would I let my love for my wife be circumstantial to a season that only lasts three or four years? It would be the dumbest thing I could ever do in my life is to let a circumstance that will only last a season dictate my pursuit of her. Because the season will end and what will I end up with? I will end up with a stale marriage and I don't know what to do now. But if I will chase her and pursue her like Christ chased the church through through all the difficult seasons, then at the end, it will be, oh man, come on, there ain't nothing like a husband and wife who have walked through it together with their heads up, chasing each other the whole way. Man, you can't hurt us. You think you're coming here and separate us? You must be crazy. So it was never circumstantial. The pursuit cannot be circumstantial. Till death do us part, and not by your hand or mine. (laughs) All right, so you you wrote that down? It's never circumstantial. The second thing, the pursuit is never complete. It's never complete. Here's one of the mistakes we make in our lives. We... We tend to look at happiness as a Google pen on a map, and we just kind of throw it out there, tunk, out there in the future somewhere. And then, and then our goal is to work hard, do all these things to reach that point in time, and then we will be happy. We, we put it out there, if I had this much money, if I had this type of relationship, if I had, if I had lived in this house, in this town, and my, my kids were better than they are, and all the, you know, all this out there, a point in time, I will be happy. And God never set our lives up that way. The problem is, is we're looking, we're pursuing happiness and not being happy in the pursuit. Boy, that's a totally different, you should write that down right now. I'm telling you. Somebody that's dating, you should write it down right now. Because here's the problem. If you're not happy with your spouse today, then there's a chance you won't be happy with your spouse at that point in the future. But here's what I can guarantee you. If you will pursue them like Christ pursues the church and like the church pursues Christ, and love them that way, then I guarantee you whatever you walk through into that point, you will be in love the whole way. Because your happiness is not found at some random point in the future, it's found in pursuing together. Oh, come on, we gotta get this. Our pursuit, our pursuit of God is not, is not complete when we figured out everything about God. Paul said we look through a glass dimly. There's, there's no way in this, in this realm of, of time that we live in that we can understand all of God. And listen, man, I'm gonna let you off the hook. There's no way in this realm of time you will understand everything about your wife. In the misnomer that you can, God created a spouse for us that you can be in constant pursuit and learn something new every day. And if it's not new, she'll just change it. (laughs) I had a friend one time that said, he read the Five Love Languages book, which I highly recommend all of you read. I read it six years after I was married, and I went, oh my goodness, I'm an idiot. Um, So the five love languages book that God talks about knowing your spouse's love language and speaking to them in that language. And oftentimes it's different from your own. And that's how you fill up their love tank and all this stuff. And the guy said, after 25 years, man, I had it nailed down and then she changed it. (laughs) I said, keep chasing, bro. Keep chasing. But the beauty about the pursuit is it never ends. 
That it's a, you can constantly learn more. Listen, lazy people say they figured it all out. That, that's an excuse for not running anymore, right? I'm in the best shape of my life. I don't need to do, do anything else. As soon as you say you're in the best shape of your life, I don't need to do anything else, is when you start to become fat. As soon as we let our guard down and say, I don't need to chase anymore. I've won the prize. I figured it all out. Uh, you know, this is the way she is. I'm not going to... This is the way he is. It's not going to be any different. I figured it all. That's when it starts to go downhill, not in the pursuit. So the pursuit never ends. It's constant, right till your death. It's all the way to the end. I can chase her. I can chase her in wheelchair if I have to. Amen? So it's never circumstantial and it's never complete. Instead of pursuing happiness, find happiness in the pursuit. This is how I can have joy in suffering and pain. This is how I can have joy in suffering and pain. I say it again. This is how I can have joy in suffering and pain because I'm not chasing happiness. I'm living in it. I'm, pers- I'm happy in the pursuit of each other. All right, the last thing. You ready? The band wants to come up. The pursuit is what guarantees the value. Do you realize you're the only one that is allowed to assign value to things in your life? You remember growing up and your dad was like, man, that thing's worth a lot. Don't mess it up. You're like, I don't, I don't think so. Do you know how much it costs to heat and cool this place, boy? Were you born in a barn? I don't remember. I was like, zero. And I don't really have a recollection. So I could have been, but I'm not sure. But the, so I, had no, I assigned no value to the cost of electricity when I was growing up. Just leave the door open. That way I don't have to open it up when I come back in. Seems sensible to me, right? So I never, I couldn't assign the same value that he did with him because he was, he was working to provide for it. My parents worked to provide for electricity. Now I'm saying the same thing. Shut the door! I don't even use the barn thing because it doesn't even, my kids are like a barn. <laughs> Who, who's born in a barn? Well, Jesus was born in a manger. Like, so I just say, listen, can't leave the door open. You're trying to, the, the other famous, you're trying to heat and cool the outside? No, I'm just trying to make it convenient to come back in. So, so you're the only one that can assign value to things in your life. And that's why there's things in, in my life that I assign value to that you find worthless. I just had this happen in Africa. I was buying, I, I don't buy like regular trinkets and markets anymore. I got enough of those little things. I bought some tools from a guy who was currently using the tools. And I knew I could never get those anywhere else, but right there in that village, in that spot, and I wanted what he had. And it was valuable to me. And the, the other African guy that was with me, with me went, what do you want that for? And I said, I could buy this soapstone anywhere on the planet. The tool he's using, I can't get. He made that himself out of a stick and a, and a file. I can't get that anywhere else. That's more valuable to me than the stuff he's carving with it. Because I can, a lot, I can find those in, in stores in the U.S., but I can't buy that tool. And so one guy was looking at me going, why do you want that? And I was like, that's more valuable than all this other stuff. To me. I'm the one that gets to assign the value. So watch this. The fact that you're chasing your spouse automatically assigns value to them. And when you stop pursuing them, it automatically assigns value to them as well. It goes one way or the other. There's no, there's no middle ground. There's no, it, it, it's like the stock market of your marriage. You're either chasing, you're either chasing, you're either chasing, or you're not chasing. It never goes like this. You're either bringing up her beauty or you're not. You're, you're, either, you're either walking in, in, in life with him as a partner or you're not. You're, you're, either, you're either being in the image of Christ in the church or you're not. You're either assigning value or you're declining in value. And so Paul could say it like this. Paul said it like this. He said, this present suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now watch this. He's saying that my, the God's pursuit of me and my pursuit of God might lead me into some suffering, but this suffering is not as valuable as the relationship. So remember, it cannot be circumstantial and it never ends. So what happens is when difficult circumstances, we, de- we decrease the value. 
and what will enable you to walk through hell and high water together is you will say the value that we have together is worth more than whatever we whatever happens to us come on did you hear that if I'm chasing you and pursuing you, the value of us together is worth more than anything that can happen to us. So listen, that's why Paul can say this present suffering is not worthy to be compared. You can look at your spouse and say, I don't care what happens. I, in sickness or in health, in wealth or in poverty, till death do us part. That's what we say at the beginning, but we stop chasing each other, we forget. So we need to make that recommitment that listen, there is nothing more valuable in my life than you. I will chase you to the end of my days. And, and by doing that, I'm assigning you more value than any suffering I can have, any pain that could come across, anything that could happen, you're more valuable than that. Amen? You assign the value. If your spouse doesn't feel like they're worth anything, it's because you put the price tag on it. But the beauty is, is that we can also change the price. And listen, you need to do the opposite of Walmart. There ain't no smiley faces with a discount in this deal. It needs to be expensive. It needs to be expensive. Did you hear me, church? I heard a guy say one time, if you don't charge enough, they won't think it's worth it. He's talking about business. If you're too cheap, they're gonna think the thing's not done well. So you better charge enough to make them think that they're getting their money's worth. So when you're in a relationship, you should put a value on them enough that they think they're worth it. Why don't you stand? We're gonna pray together. You know what I hope after today? I hope a lot of you start chasing each other again. I hope that you never stop. I hope that you send text messages to each other every day. I hope that you just take phone calls if you do that sort of thing anymore. I hope you write love notes to each other. I hope you take off work early and show up as a surprise. I hope the pursuit is rekindled today. I hope that at the end of this month that your wife or your husband feels more valuable than they do in this current moment. I hope that your marriage will be uncaged into this whole new adventure that God designed it to be and that together the both of you can imitate what the church in Christ look like. It could be great testimony to all around you. Amen. I want to pray that blessing over you today. Father, I pray that you'd rekindle the chase today, Lord. I pray that you'd rekindle the pursuit. Lord, all across this building, I pray that young and old would begin to chase each other like newlyweds again, God. I pray that it would never stop. I pray that we'd make a commitment, no matter what circumstance comes, that we would pursue each other till death do us part and model what you've done for us with Christ in the church. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Come on, give him honor and glory today.